Edward Halpern, and I'm the Chancellor of New York Medical College. I uh, just returned to New York last night from Atlanta. My oldest daughter had a baby, my first grandchild. <laughs> For all of you in biotechnology, I want to tell you that the three worst words in the lexicon of grandparenthood are uh, when your child takes you to a room full of cardboard boxes of baby stuff, and each of the boxes are emblazoned with the three words which strike terror into the heart of a grandfather, some assembly required. <laughs> My friends, I am convinced that there is a club of mechanical engineers in China writing instructions for this stuff. Okay, let's really make the Americans nuts. <laughs> Take the short tube and attach it to the long tube. There are 20 metal tubes in this box of varying sizes. None of them are clearly labeled short tube or long tube. And your job is to sit there cross-legged on the floor with the added impetus that your daughter is over your shoulder saying, if this doesn't get done by tonight, there'll be no bassinet for your grandchild to sleep in. <laughs> get this kid out of here and leave me alone. Right? I have several advanced degrees I can figure out. So I'm glad to be back at work. Uh, you are on the grasslands, ladies and gentlemen. This was a farm in the 19th century. And then when the United States entered World War I in 1917, this became an army base. The war ended in 1918, and the army of the United States demobilized in 1919. And most of this land was turned over to Westchester County. And it had an adult tuberculosis sanatorium and a children's tuberculosis sanatorium and the official residence of the public health commissioner of Westchester County and the Grasslands Hospital. And a lot of the land became vegetable gardens because the theory was that the therapy for tuberculosis was fresh air, sunshine, and vegetable gardens. And for those of you who approached this building by coming on Sunshine Cottage Road, that's where the name of the street came from because Sunshine Cottage was on Sunshine Cottage Road at Children's Tuberculosis Sanatorium. Among the buildings that were eventually built on the property were the one you were sitting in. This was the laboratory of Ernst Winder. Ernst Winder was a medical student after World War II, and he was assigned by his professor of thoracic surgery, Uarts Graham, to analyze what was considered an important and unknown topic. Was there any connection between the occurrence of bronchogenic carcinoma and cigarette smoking? And Winder, as a medical student, had a few innovative ideas. He asked people with lung cancer, did you smoke, yes or no? And people who did not have lung cancer, did you smoke, yes or no? That was not innovative. What was innovative was he said, how much do you smoke? How many packs for how many years? And in 1950, as a medical student, he published an article in the Journal of the American Medical Association <laughs> linking cigarette smoking both in amount and duration with the occurrence of lung cancer it was in the history of oncology the singular American contribution to the debate along with Dahl and Pico's work in England. Eventually, Winder goes on to build this laboratory building where he works on the etiology of adult female breast cancer, colorectal cancer, cancer of the pancreas, and lung cancer. And this was his National Cancer Institute laboratory, which ultimately New York Medical College purchased after his death and was repurposed for what you're going to see today. New York Medical College was founded in 1860. It was founded in Manhattan at 20th Street and 3rd Avenue. It was founded because the editor of the New York Post, his name was William Cullen Bryan, thought that mainstream medicine was nuts. William Cullen Bryan is the same Bryan as Bryan Park behind the 42nd Street Library. He's the same William Cullen Bryan who your high school English teacher probably forced you to memorize poems like Thanatopsis. And Bryan did not understand vomiting and bleeding and purging and leeches, it didn't make any sense to him. He thought therapy should be diet and exercise and fresh air and sunshine and infinite dilutions of drugs, what was called homeopathy. And homeopathy was eventually shown to be quackery, but uh, Brian's medical school survived. 
Brian also had some very unusual ideas about medical education. He created a medical school for women three years after he opened New York Medical College in 1863. Canada's first female physician did not graduate from McGill University or University of Toronto or University of Western Ontario. She graduated from New York Medical College in the 1860s. The first African-American female physician in the state of New York graduated from New York Medical College in the 1870s. First African-American male in the 1880s. Uh, first white majority medical school to have scholarships for African-American medical students, New York Medical College, 1928. First white majority medical school to have an African-American dean, New York Medical College, in the 1950s. And he was a she. Uh, the medical school in the United States, which most egregiously ignored the anti-Roman Catholic and anti-Jewish admission policies in the United States for medical education from the 1920s to the 1960s, New York Medical College. The college has been a bastion against bigotry in medical education since its founding. We are a health sciences university. We have degrees PhD, Master of Science, Master of Science in Speech Pathology, Master of Public Health, Doctor of Public Health, Doctor of Physical Therapy, Doctor of Medicine. Within the next two years, we're opening a nursing school, a PA program, a master's program in medical ethics. We just opened a master's program in biology education, and uh, we're going to open a dental school. So we are one of 30 health sciences universities in the United States, which means we're a university, but no English department and no football team. <laughs> we, only, we only grant advanced degrees in the health professions. Welcome to New York Medical College. As I'm going to talk about when we get to the ribbon cutting, uh, what we're here about today is what I will assert is partnership. Uh, what makes health care better is not the sole action of funding agencies for biomedical science, not the sole actions of academic medicine, and not the sole actions of entrepreneurs in the biotechnology industry. It is a partnership of all three. Facility we're going to be celebrating today, and you're going to get to see is about celebrating that partnership. And while it is in part about uh, economic development, from where I'm sitting, it is about making sure that the health care for our children and our grandchildren, our great grandchildren, is better than that that we receive. And the best way to predict the future in biomedicine is to invent it ourselves. So welcome and. Godspeed on our work today. Thanks for coming.